Thanks so much for joining for this engineering education roundtable. Um, just a bit of background. This roundtable is actually part of the Virtues and Vocations Initiative here at Duke University, which seeks to make character, purpose, and meaning central to education, pre-professional and professional education in particular. Basically, what we're trying to do in this initiative is spark a set of conversations amongst educators and practitioners with similar interests to create a community of practice, if you will, across and within professions. Here today, our hope is to seed one such conversation amongst folks interested in engineering education. And we've brought this group together, folks who may or may not already know one another super well to begin that conversation. This is very much an experiment, both because we are trying to build community via Zoom and because we're still learning what the contours of such a community might look like in the, in the space of engineering. So I really appreciate your willingness to experiment with us here today. A brief note about logistics and an overview of the flow. First, please note uh, that there are lots of folks working behind the scenes. So if you have technical difficulties, they're ready to swoop in and assist. Second, we are going to be recording the opening panel uh, conversation. So if you were uncomfortable, uh, having your face recorded on the screen, you're welcome uh, to turn off your video. <clears throat> Second, uh, in terms of the overview and flow of conversation, the opening panel will run about 40 minutes. You're welcome uh, to raise questions either by raising your hand or submitting them through the chat. Uh, we're then going to break into three different breakout groups for about 30 minutes before returning to plenary. Uh, and so uh, before I turn this over to Ravi Bellamkondo, Dean of Pratt School of Engineering here at Duke and a frequent partner in crime in questions of purpose, character and virtue, uh, who will lead the conversation. Uh, he'll be leading the conversation with founding president of Olin College, Rick Miller and founding chair of the Department of Engineering at Wake Forest, Olga Periakis. Uh, I won't share further background on either of these illustrious individuals, these path-breaking trailblazer trio, but do want to refer you to those bios that we circulated previously. Everybody participating, you should have their bios that Gare sent out a little bit ago. And with that, I want to turn it over to Ravi to begin the conversation. Thanks all for joining and thanks to Ravi for kicking off this conversation. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, many thanks to Keenan Center for Ethics. We're fortunate to have you and the center help us uh, with this conversation. And many thanks to Greg Jones in our Divinity School, who's an amazing, amazing individual, enriches our lives. I hope many of you know him already. If you don't, I hope you get to know him soon. <laughs> um, you know, partly people say that uh, leadership, uh, one of the traits of leadership, and I know many of you also uh, exemplify this, is to actually convene. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I'm glad uh, that we're doing this today uh, and I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Um, so what I might do is, uh, Olga and uh, Rick, um, if you don't mind, uh, I might pose a question. Uh, would love to hear from both of you in whatever order you choose. Um, uh, if I have some thoughts on it, I, 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 I'll add in, I'll try to restrain <laughs> my contributions to some degree. Uh, and then if anyone else um, feels like they would like to weigh in, please uh, use the chat or raise your hand. And uh, if I don't notice, I, one, one of us will notice me and I will weigh in because we, I really like this to be a conversation as there's a lot of wisdom in the room beyond that. Uh, we should really have a discussion. And then we'll have a uh, set aside time for in the break breakout sections to delve further in a smaller group uh, into these topics. So um, with that, I'll just start us off with, <laughs> you know, all of us teach and, and many of, uh, for many years we've taught and, and this is sort of the, why should we care question, right? So, uh, and it's a good place to start this conversation. Why does this matter? Why does character and virtue matter uh, in engineering, especially when you think of engineering as a technical, uh, objective, uh, not room for interpretation, you know, things have to be, you know, there's ground truths to it. Uh, this kind of formulation of what engineering is and this infusion of character and virtue somehow 
doesn't seem to fit for, for one perspective. So, you know, I wonder if we could get a, a reaction from Rick uh, and Olga first about why you think through your work uh, and your thoughts, uh, it matters in engineering to, uh, because we're all busy, the world requires all sorts of things. We need to keep our elections secure. There's many things, there are many demands on engineering. <laughs> um, is this an important topic and why should anyone care? Uh, I may be a little bit complicated. So uh, maybe we'll start off with you, Olga, and then we'll go to Rick, if you don't. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm really excited. I'm excited to learn from everybody because everyone around this virtual room is an engineering education leader. So um, I do not pretend, none of us here pretend to have all the answers. And so I'm really excited for the conversation and the exchange. Um, really appreciate the, the Duke team organizing this and bringing us together and really grateful for this opportunity. Um, in answering the question, like why, um, I mean, I, I, before we were engineers, we're, we're, we're humans. <laughs> before we took on the identity of being engineers, we're, we're people and every day we make critical decisions. Upon wearing the hat of an engineer, we also make critical decisions every day. Um, we build teams, we build engineering systems, we make decisions that impact society. And so to imagine that that can only be achieved by a technical set of knowledge is simply naive. And so fundamentally, I feel like to be a good engineer First and foremost, we need to be virtuous individuals. And so educating the whole person is at the core of, of, of the mission of all our institutions. So we're educators. We want to produce professionals, whether they call themselves engineers or not, or whether they choose to stay in a path towards engineering or not, it, it is fundamental that we help them understand those connections beyond just the technical aspects that yes, absolutely are fundamental to engineering education. And so for me, when I think about what it, what it means, it's, it's the, just a real world practice. And it's about decisions that we make every, every single day. Um, and so without thinking about character, um, as a way to guide us in the process, uh, is yeah. I'll just no, stop there, you. but it's 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 it starts there. Rick. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's something I've thought a lot about. I like Olga. I certainly would not be comfortable with anyone thinking that I have answers to things. I don't have a PhD in this very field. I haven't published anything in this. I'm one of those people who just sort of jumped in the deep end and started moving my arms around, to figure out how to swim. But there's some things that you don't have to have a PhD in order to notice. Uh, one of them is engineering, particularly in the 20th century, has become a field that literally changes the world. Um, we have a responsibility now because of the power of the technology that we work with that affects so many lives to be much more thoughtful. I mean, what we normally teach in engineering before the ethics comes in is what we can do. Most of our courses are about feasibility, what you can do with natural law. Um, but ethics is not about what you can do, it's about what you should do. Um, and a lot of times, even when you start with well-intentioned uh, work, it turns out that the outcomes are not what you expected. This is pretty easy to see uh, in other professions like medicine, for example. Uh, a physician might be uh, devastated by the outcome of a genetic disease on an infant. And so they work for years to create a tool to edit the gene in order to elim eliminate this, um, this fault. And it's pretty soon the tool is available, it's now called CRISPR. And this tool is really helpful in medicine. But what about the unintended consequences? It turns out that this tool that we created has lots of other possibilities as well. 
And in fact, the unintended consequences is an ethical issue that needs to be addressed on a very large scale. Um, in trying to, to deal with this um, in, in on my own, uh, teaching a course called Issues in Leadership and Ethics for about 10 years uh, with young people, I found that, that, you, that in undergraduates, you really need to start earlier. It, it, the, the business of dealing with how many angels that can dance on the head of a pin in a really uh, difficult, complex uh, philosophical debate um, misses the point. I think it's it's about uh, it's deeper than that. It's about personal motivation. Um, so I would parse it this way, and I'm going to stop after this. Um, what we should do is a question that has two branches on the tree. One of them is what we as a society should do, and that does have to do with philosophy and ethics, and what we as an individual should do, and that's that's deeper. That in fact involves psychology and involves. Um, a, a number of uh, processes in the brain that happen before the prefrontal cortex even arises. So uh, behavior modification comes in, uh, values that you grow up with. And at the undergraduate level, um, I would spend most of my time worrying about the, the, the second branch on the tree, but what I as an individual should do uh, before we get to the advanced course and talking about uh, philosophy. Anyway, I think it's critically important. I think the grand challenges that we're seeing now make that absolutely imperative. Um, it should be a core subject in all engineering, I believe, just like every profession. W one last point about this, a profession. Profession is different. Um, when you go to a doctor, you trust the doctor to make decisions on your behalf when you're unconscious in the operating room and you're not capable of questioning them with the latest technical developments in their field. So you have to trust their expertise and you have to trust their motivations. And when you go to an engineer uh, on behalf of society, they bear a similar responsibility. Their competence has got to be implicit and their motivations have to be pure as well. Um, luckily, we have a great starting point because it turns out you might know this, the Gallup organization measures the public trust in different professions and I was just looking at this a few minutes ago and the highest public trust of any profession is nurses. Um, but the second highest is a tie between engineers and medical doctors. And that's at like 65% um, and public trust there. If you go down the list, bankers have 24%, lawyers have an 18%, same with business executives. Um, turns out state governors have about a 17% and Car salesmen have a 9%. So we're at a good starting point. And I, that's where I'll stop. Nick, you have the gift of making everybody feel good about themselves. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> everybody here at least. Uh, thank you for that. No, it's, it, that's very thoughtful. Um, yeah, you know, I also, uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, we'll just add a couple of notes. And so one is that we cannot help but notice. And by, by engineering here, I know there are some computer scientists here as well. Uh, we, we do mean it holistically, including computing. Um, you know, the news we read, uh, the, the, the friends we make, uh, uh, the, 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 the transactions we enter into for buying or selling. You know, the, the, the sphere of influence, as you were alluding to, both of you, has expanded vastly in the last few years. It is no longer in engineering. Uh, the, the, the contributions we make are not just to systems, but it deeply it affects larger and larger parts of our lives and, and hence a greater urgency to recognize amongst all of us that um, we cannot just say, oh, we just made the widget and then the widget does all these other things and I have no responsibility for it. And I think this is what you were alluding to, Rick, when you were talking about CRISPR, uh, the technique of gene editing or, or, or algorithms that uh, do interesting things. Um, uh, so that, that is a thought. Let, let me, I, I want to uh, probe a little deeper into something Olga brought up, uh, but I'd like both of you to uh, respond to this. Um, this issue of virtues and character, uh, one could argue that as all humans, um, you know, as you started your comments, Olga, on this note, you know, all humans, we, we should do this as a part of education, as a, as a part of developing our people, we, we're educators. Uh, 
but is there something uh, peculiar to the engineering so that all out certain virtues or certain aspects of character? Um, w w what might be uh, particular to, because we all have professional ethics, you know, if you take the PE exam, you know, there, there's, a, there's a thing that's already, you know, you, you don't make stuff up, you don't lie, these kinds of things. But beyond those accepted quote unquote professional ethics in engineering, um, are there things that are specific or peculiar to engineering in terms of virtues and ethics? Or do you think, um, not necessarily, I mean, in all science, uh, th th there's a common thread to these things. Any, any thoughts on that part? Either of you could, uh, or if you want me to, I, we can switch order and we can go with Rick first this time. <laughs> Um, you know, as um, so the, the our team here at Wake Forest, we're, we're so grateful to work with a team of philosophers every day, and so I've learned so much from them. Uh, so Dr. Michael Lem is, is one of those people. We've also hired a philosopher, uh, who's a postdoc working with our team. Um, with immense uh, gratitude to the Kern Family Foundation as part of the King Grant for that. And so I've learned a lot. And so when I, leave, when I read the literature on virtues, all of them are important to all of us, right? And so uh, when you look at that list, they definitely apply to all of us, independent of sort of those labels we put on each other or, or put on ourselves in terms of the professional sort of identities that we each have. Um, now, if I can maybe reframe the question, I do think there are some virtues that are inherently um, well, we're well positioned, we're well positioned to tackle. Um, and then there's ones that we need to probably make more progress on. And so to Rick's point, um, the good thing is that the society sees us that they can trust us. And so integrity integrity as a virtue um, is an important one. And I think that's one that it not only is built into our code of ethics as, as, as engineers, but that, that's one that I think it's easy to start a conversation in an engineering classroom and to make more progress on. Other ones that come to mind that are just ones that we can easily connect to what we do in our engineering classes, our curiosity. You know, engineers are seen as, uh, as individuals who, who embrace ambiguity, who embrace the uncertainty, who understand constraints. And so a curiosity that comes to understanding the engineering systems we work on is also inherently easy to talk about curiosity, both from a technical perspective, but also from a virtue perspective. Um, another one is critical thinking. Uh, so critical thinking as a virtue becomes another one that, that, is, is, that is an easy one to sort of just tackle within our engineering classrooms. Um, I'm sure there's other ones. The ones that are harder for us are things like um, courage, things like humility, things like authenticity, hope, um, I'm trying to think, uh, I think empathy is another one that we could do well, could do better on, um, but that's sort of as a, as a first response and not to take up more sort of airspace. Um, that's, that's my best attempt at beginning to answer, to answer that. No, oh, thank you, that was very thoughtful. Uh, Rick? Well, she did a great job of covering the primary landscape. Um, I would say the issues that are hard to talk about are um, the personal decisions to put others first and to take that as a very serious thing. Uh, it has to be an intrinsic uh, issue. So, so when I talk to students about um, their role as an engineer, I'm often talking to them about their role as, a, as building a community, building a company, building a, a group of uh, engineers that serve the public that, that is marked by ethical behavior. Um, what does that take? I think it takes three things. 
Um, one of them is to realize that ethical behavior is always completely voluntary. It's what you would do if no one were watching. It has to come from inside. Um, this is not something you learned in a book. This is this becomes an identity who you are. Uh, so how so you so you have to develop that somehow. It also has to be um, a habit of putting the the interests of others before self. So it's it, you have to watch this because our think our DNA is always driving us for self-interest. So man, if I if I told them that the bridge needs to be a little bit thicker, um, it would cost more because then would have to be more designed and then my bottom line would go up. I could pay my mortgage off a little quicker. You know, who's going to know? Um, they don't know. They're not structural engineers. Um, that conflict is always there. And what it means to be ethical is to be the fiduciary, the person who takes the responsibility of the best interest of someone else. That's what it means being a professional. And the last part of this is that when you see ethical behavior happen in the engineering world, it's not a one kind, one time occurrence. It's not like you're once in a while you had this, this breakthrough idea and you were ethical once. And then you lapse back into being, you know, self-interest for the rest of your life. It's usually a pattern that's developed over a lifetime. It's you learn to walk and then you learn to run. Um, it, it's a, a pattern of repetition. So in a way, it's kind of like teaching safety. You don't take a course in safety and you get a gold star on your forehead and now I'm a safe person. It's a culture. It, it's, it's a set of deep-seated beliefs and it's a way of looking at life and it doesn't happen in a course. It's something that the entire community, every faculty member, every student has to pay attention to it. We're paying a lot of attention to COVID right now in this whole business of wearing a mask putting the safety of others first um, is not too far off from trying to teach the culture of ethics. No, thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, I think the thought that occurs to me as I listen to both of you is that I think about my undergraduate engineering experience. I think about the curriculum that I get to review in different schools as a, in my experience as a teacher and on ABET committees and other visiting committees and things. And I can't help but think that there's a large gulf between the conversation, the two of you and the ideas you're proposing and actually what's in the curriculum. The curriculum, most of it, generally speaking, uh, seems to be, uh, and I, I, it may be different in our, uh, in our you know, same, uh, group here, but generally speaking, the the consumer of engineering you know i don't know how present this others that we're serving through this uh, how, how present they are uh, in the time of one's design of an algorithm or of a widget because the emphasis is on efficiency uh, power uh, cost uh, you know design Right, so the, 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 it, how central is the human consumer of the systems we generate in how we teach, in the courses, in the technical aspects? And I just have the feeling that the answer is not very. <laughs> uh, so maybe I would ask each of you to reflect to the extent that you in All In and you in a new program at Wake and I love that you have philosophers integrated into your team. Uh, how have you tackled this uh, by trying to incorporate this, not in one required class somewhere, but as a culture? Uh, is it curricular or is it extracurricular? Um, and how does it, how do you deal with all sorts of challenges? I can imagine that you're just softening up engineering and it's not as rigorous if you bring in all this foo-foo stuff in there. So I'm, I don't want to put words in you, but I was just wondering if you could share a little bit about your experience of trying to do this formally in a curriculum, not as a, let's all go to church on Sunday kind of thing, right? So uh, could you reflect on that if you don't mind? Well, I'll start first this time. Um, as the old guy, I am so envious of what Olga is doing. I mean, I think 
starting with a blank sheet with a deliberate goal of trying to build um, a culture of ethics into everything you do, professional ethics, is such an amazing uh, start. And it's something I think is the, is the path of the future. So I'm hoping people will uh, pay a lot of attention to the experiments that come out of Wake. Um, and Olga and her team are doing great work. Um, when we started Olin 20 years ago, that was not uh, the top of the list of things that we were thinking about. In fact, I remember in my case, um, what happened was ABAT accreditation requires that graduates have some exposure to professional ethics. I mean, we've all seen this. Um, it's part of the checklist of things that you have to do. Um, we talked about that in our faculty and nobody but raised their hand to deal with it. <laughs> no, we didn't have any uh, philosophers on our team. Um, so is what often happens, um, it landed on my desk. So if it's not gonna happen, then I guess the president has to deal with it. Um, so I started a course. The, the course wasn't really the solution to this. What it was about was legitimizing it, um, making it something that everyone sees is okay to talk about, is in fact important to deal with, um, planting seeds in kids' heads that these questions they should ask in all of their classes, not just the one that we're talking about. Um, over time, uh, we've been really fortunate because the students are the power tool for making change in, uh, in a curriculum. And a group of students became really interested in this and they began bringing it up in other courses. Um, if you fast forward to today, we have a culture now where I don't know how many, but it's a significant fraction of our faculty are, are constantly talking about ethics from folks in arts and humanities to folks in computer science and everything in between. And there is now kind of a movement um, to uh, deal with what I'd call public interest and in technology. You, you might know about this. This is um, a, a topic that's being picked up at other universities as well. Um, th this is kind of a way of taking responsibility for um, Facebook and the kinds of things that Facebook does that are unintentional but are having a problem. So maybe we need to talk about what does it take to make um, technology that's in the public interest? Um, and that's, that's not something that I'm doing. I have nothing to do with that. But we have a group of faculty who constantly meet and talk about it and students. So that's getting close to becoming a cultural value where people will embrace it. It's so not at all complete. I mean, there's much more to having, um, I mean, what about uh, social justice and what about uh, Black Lives Matter and what about a lot of other issues, but we're, we're starting the conversation. Thank you, Rick. Olga? Um, yeah, that's um, where that's important to begin. Um, so when we started, okay, so I guess I, I'm not sure to what extent people know but this is the second time for me being a found, founding faculty member of a new department. So I learned a lot the first time and my, my list of what to do and my list of what not to do, especially my list of what not to do was really long. Um, <laughs> and so I knew, and I, and I, and I don't say that to, to offend anyone, but rather that it's very easy when you start a new program to focus your attention on the curriculum, on the content of what is in the curriculum. And, you know, divide the team and develop some course titles and then go off and teach. It's really, it's really, that's, that's, it's really easy to do that. I knew when, when given this opportunity to build an engineering program for the second time, that a different kind of C had to be at the forefront. And that C is culture. And so culture is more important than content and the curriculum. And so that was intentional. And so I wanted to make sure that in hiring the founding team of faculty, in onboarding new students, that I was at the forefront of how we were tackling and beginning to, yes, develop the curriculum. Um, and so um, the, when the founding team of faculty came to Wake Forest, 
we were actually here six weeks before the students came. And yeah, we had some initial conversations of we're teaching, we're about to teach the first engineering class. And so how do you initiate the conversation? Do you start the conversation by figuring out what content we teach? Or we actually started talking about what kind of culture do we want to create in this class? What kind of environment do we want to create? What are the values that are important to us? And then secondarily, yes, what are those content layers that should be part of this first year? And so this shared visioning began to take place, which has continued um, for us. And it's not something you do once, but it's something that truly is iterative. We started to envision what is that, uh, what is that ideal graduate? What do they look like? What are they doing? What decisions are they making? How can you, we work backwards to begin to now develop um, a curriculum that, that, that provides sort of that um that direction and so it actually turns out that for us pedagogy also preceded content so how we teach is is more important than what exactly we teach um and so the priorities it's it, both are important um both are important but how we teach is more directly linked to sort of the culture that we create. So pedagogy was a driver. And I'm telling you that right, even right now, right before this meeting, we had a department meeting where we're trying to kind of standardize some elements in our curriculum that are the content pieces. So we're three years in, and now we're beginning to standardize some of that. But it's because culture was at the forefront. And so that took priority in how we hired. Um, we, re we reside in a, in a university that has a very rich liberal arts culture. And we came to Wake Forest for that. We wanted to envision a new kind of engineer. And so yes, that is a luxury that, that we had to kind of start from scratch. Um, but as we began to envision this future engineer, virtues were embedded. We just didn't, we didn't, we didn't know at the time that those were virtues, but we talked about um, compassion. We talked about social justice. We talked about uh, what it means to be an effective team member. Uh, it, 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 we talked about what it means to be an engineer in our organization and to influence that organization. So we talked about leadership. Uh, we talked about integrity and so it became visible to us a year at the end of that first year that there were so many virtues embedded there and that's kind of when we began our work with philosophy to help us see what was there we just didn't call it virtues at the onset um and no, so I, the, yeah no no go ahead uh, no i i i commend you and the entire team for you know, when you first start a department, many times I've seen this happen where people are very worried about standing up an accredited program and get very technical very quickly about the content and don't do the opposite of what you just described. So I, I commend you for and congratulate you for that. I, I, had, I did have a follow on question. Uh, in our conversations that uh, Josh Trusky has been leading uh, um, uh, at Duke, so it has come up that our faculty, when you hire faculty, you hire them for research expertise, you hire them for intellectual merits, you, you hire them for, yes, they are interested in teaching and they, we care deeply about their teaching and their caring about students, but we hire them for these other things. You want, uh, you want to build a group in AI or you want to build a group in uh, XYZ. So how does one deal with this aspect of we don't really have the expertise to do what you're talking about, right? Because you have embedded some philosophers in there uh, and maybe in Olin, you could comment on Rick, how this came to be, but uh, I didn't in my graduate school take a class on ethics even, not even, you know, not, well, we did research ethics and lab and all that kind of stuff, but, you know, so how do you deal with the challenge or uh, concern that our faculty have 
that they're just not trained for such conversations, that these conversations are sensitive, require a certain kind of training. Now, the obvious glaring uh, counter argument is that, but then we're training students to build these systems that are impacting humans in these profound ways, that that is true also, uh, but our faculty realize that that is true, but they still don't feel like they have the expertise to weigh in on this. Have you run into such a thing or other challenges? How should one deal with this or how have you dealt with it? Uh, especially when the premium on hiring faculty in our one university is, is to hire scholars or at the forefront of whatever technical field they're in, uh, all that stuff. So how does one pull this off? Well, I can say that that was the first question that happened when I stood up in a faculty meeting and said, since no one is going to deal with the engineering ethics, then I'm going to have to deal with it. And the first question was, but do you have a PhD in philosophy or in ethics? Uh, of course not. Um, I, I think that is an important question for a certain kind of ethics. I don't think it's a prerequisite for the most fundamental aspect. And let me explain this. Um, if we're talking about you know, what we should do and the we is collectively the society then yes, I think understanding the philosophy of ethics, Kantianism, utilitarianism, all that is critical because there'll be a public debate. There has to be a consensus developed and laws are passed. Um, I, I normally send students to Michael Sandel's course at, on justice at Harvard, which is available online. And it's remarkable for the depth and the nuance that comes out, not something I can do. The other part, what should I do? Um, you don't need to have a PhD in ethics to begin to deal with that. I start by saying, are you a parent? Have you ever had kids? Um, the questions you have to make on behalf of your children are not that far away. Um, let's start there. And I think that um, understanding the responsibility we have to others changes when a person inherits responsibility for someone else inherently um, in a family. Uh, I've also found that Personality plays a big role in this, uh, in building the culture. Um, we ran into this woman at, um, she's now at the Darden School of Virginia, and it was quite good. Um, uh, Mary Gentile is her name, and she started a program called Giving Voice to Values. Um, and she said most of the time that ethical problems happen in a company or, or in a real practical case, it's not because people were not, didn't have a PhD in ethics to figure out what was wrong. I mean, I think the guy who ran Enron he did have a PhD in ethics or something close to it. Um, it's not that he didn't know what was happening. Um, what you need is the courage to speak out when you see something that doesn't work. Um, and some people are better that, at that than others. If you happen to be an introvert and you're not good at uh, arguing for a used car, for example, you probably have a hard time confronting your boss if he's cheating on his income taxes. Um, that personal characteristic is really important to build if you're going to have culture. So how do you do it if you're, if you're recruiting faculty? That's your main question. Um, I don't have a recipe, um, but I do know that the uh, way Olin does this is ridiculous. Um, it, it, everybody meets everybody and we get letters from everybody on every faculty appointment. So um, it's very hard to fool people about where your heart is. And if you're arrogant, if you don't care about uh, others, if it's only about winning the Nobel Prize at any cost, you won't get past the first door um, at, at Olin. It, you know, there's a question of how much is too much, I don't know, but uh, this, is, this is an issue that's very prominent in the culture of our school at this point. And that's based primarily on ad hoc uh, approaches, I'm sure Olga has given this more uh, thought with uh, the help of philosophers in, in her corner. Um, one thing I would say is that, you know, the philosophers in our corner kind of came in about a year into the program. And so I share, I share that because we innately came to Wake Forest wanting to build an engineering program in a really rich liberal arts tradition. And so that's what drove us to come here. And so to Rick's point, yeah, we, we, we have PhDs in engineering, not, not ethics, but there was this innate desire to truly educate 
in a well-rounded way a future generation of engineers. And so we wanted that, we desired that. We simply didn't have the sophisticated language to call things virtues. But we established really quickly, within a month of the founding team coming together, we established and identified six core values that were important to us. And um, so they're compassion. So I'm going to in, integrity, growth, compassion, inclusion, empowerment, and joy. So these were values that came from the team. And, and, and it was only when, when the philosopher sort of looked at them, they said, you know, those are virtues. And so again, I'll just point to the fact that we have our own language to describe things and we can start, we just need to start somewhere. And so starting somewhere is better than not starting at all. Um, and so that is where we began. We've just since then learned a better way to articulate what it is that we've done. But I'll simply say that we came into Wake Forest and started working really closely with our colleagues, historians. We have the chair of history that comes and teaches in the first year with us. And, 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 and is a Renaissance historian. So she gives the story of engineering before engineers were engineers. So history, art, philosophy, psychology, anthropology. And so without our colleagues, we can't achieve this. And so I just simply want to point out that it goes, it goes beyond philosophy to help us educate a well-rounded engineer. To the, no, to, the, to the hiring that's question, to the hiring question, just really quickly, um, in, in our position ad, the first paragraph described our values. And so we put up front who we are, what our values are, and then followed that up with, yes, we want a faculty that will be uh, successful and exceptional in teaching and exceptional in research. That is the expectation that we have. But we put those values right up front and describe who we were and this rich engagement with liberal arts. So, so that, that helped recruit faculty who kind of, that appealed to them, that motivated them. No, I appreciate that very much. Well, we have a lot of wisdom in the room. Um, I think we should uh, probably transition to the next phase where we can uh, engage uh, uh, with, all, with all the folks uh, who are listening. And perhaps I would request one thing before I, I turn things over to Suzanne who will tell us maybe how we should do that, uh, is that I think uh, it is maybe fair to say that all of you who are here uh, are part of the choir, that you, at some level you, you agree with this thesis, right? The question then is, why isn't the world already embracing this kind of vision that Olga said? And what are the obstacles and challenges to doing that? And maybe in the discussion, we could dwell a little bit on this idea of immunity to change uh, uh, things. Why is it? Why isn't this an obvious thing? Why isn't this widespread? Why isn't this embraced? And what are the challenges? Because we would be remiss if we didn't recognize those. Uh, to, to, to further this cause, if you will, right? So in the discussion groups, if you have a chance, please do dwell on that a little. 